Hello, and thank you all so much for joining us today for this exciting episode of WINS, or Women in STEM. We are live at Moat Marine Laboratory and Aquarium in Sarasota, Florida. My name is Dr. Kristen Wilkinson, and I'm a scientist with the Chicago Zoological Society's Sarasota Dolphin Research Program. I also work with the Sharks and Rays Conservation Research Program at Moat. The WINS program is funded by Moat Scientific Foundation and is aimed at highlighting some awesome women scientists, technology experts, engineers, and mathematicians. Because when students see themselves in represented in STEM, everyone wins. Today we're going to talk about animal, nu animal nutrition and about how some animals and humans are picky eaters. But first, I have a question for you, our viewers. Are you a picky eater? Feel free to type yes or no in our live chat. Wow, it looks like we do have some picky eaters out there. Let's check in with my friend Ross. Let's see if he's a picky eater too. Ross, are you there? Oh, mm. oh, mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. It mm. looks like I caught you on your lunch break. Mm -hmm. What do you mm -hmm. have there? Yeah, no, you caught me at the perfect time. I'm actually just having lunch. So perfect timing for talking about today's lesson. All about picky eaters, which I can say I'm not. I have a very well-balanced meal here. I have my hot dog. I have a cheeseburger. I have some French fries. I am covering all the food groups. So, no, nothing to worry about here. Nice, healthy lunch. Ross, are you really covering all those important food groups? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look at this cheeseburger. It has onions. It has tomatoes. It has cheese. I mean, it's pretty much a salad. Let's be real. <laughs> And I got my hot dog all set. I mean, let's see, what is bread? It's wheat. So this is pretty much, once again, a salad, french fries, potatoes. It's a healthy vegetable. Yeah, I am super covered. I, I got this. It sounds like you have a lot of starch and salt in your diet. How are you feeling? I mean, it tastes really good, and food is food. It all fills me up. So it's fine, right? I mean, energy's energy. So no problem. I mean... I am feeling a little sluggish, and I'm feeling a little sleepy. Like, I definitely couldn't run or do any, like, working out afterwards. But, I mean, that's fine. It tastes great, and it gets all processed into energy one way or another. So, it's cool. We don't have to worry about me. Well, it does sound like some of your sluggish tendencies may be related to the food you're eating. It's really important to make sure you're getting a well-balanced diet to make sure you're getting proper nutrition and have really good energy. Mm. We'll agree to disagree. It's <laughs> fine. I mean, I'm just having my salad right here, right? Oh, well, mm. it sounds like we need an expert's help. I have just the person. My friend Lisa with the Georgia Aquarium is an animal nutritionist, and I think she can help us explain why it's really important to get a well-balanced diet. What? Why? Why? That's, it's fine. I mean, yes, that's awesome that you have friends who are a nutritionist at an aquarium, but why does that pertain to me? I mean... I'm eating well-balanced meals, clearly, and she works at an aquarium. That has nothing to do with who I am. Well, Ross, humans are animals, too. And I would say it doesn't sound like your lunch is very well-balanced. But let's see if Lisa's available, and maybe she can explain it better than I can. Until then, viewers, I have a question for you. Do you know what a nutritionist is? I mean, I don't, so I don't know. We'll figure it out. Let's see. Is it someone who studies food and nutrition? An advisor for newts? Oh, I get it. Okay, like a newt traditionalist. I get that. Okay, that's my vote. Versus physical therapy. Okay, interesting. So, yeah, let's see what people say in this chat. And let's see what people do in this pop-up poll question, Kristen. Let's see what the majority of guesses are. It looks like everybody is right on target. A nutritionist is an advisor in food and nutrition. And thankfully, we have a wonderful nutritionist here with us today. Hi, Lisa. Are you there? Hi, Kristen. Hi, Ross. How are you? Great. Lisa, Ross is not enjoying a very well-balanced lunch today. I was hoping that maybe you could explain to him the importance of a well-rounded diet and how you help the animals at Georgia Aquarium make sure they're getting all of their vitamins and nutrients. 
Sure, absolutely. <laughs> Nutrition is really the cornerstone of good health. If you don't have a balanced diet, meeting all of your nutritional requirements, then it could predispose you to disease and other conditions down the road. So when I'm working with all of the animals at the Georgia Aquarium, if I'm doing my job right and providing them a well-balanced and healthy diet, then they should live long and healthy lives and not have to spend a lot of time with our veterinary um, experts at the building. So it's really important. Huh. Okay. So I guess I can kind of see that. I mean, granted, your patients go to a veterinarian. I would go to a human doctor. But I don't know. Kristen says, yes, we're all animals. Yes, we need to have a well-balanced diet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, like, I don't think I get it. So what does an average day look like to you? So, I mean, you're not a veterinarian, but you have to make sure these animals don't go to the veterinarian. So walk me through. What is a day in the life of a nutritionist at an aquarium? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I spend a lot of my time looking at the diets of the animal collection, um, trying to understand what they would eat in the wild. And then how do we make sure that we're meeting all of their nutritional needs? How do we make sure that they're getting all of the vitamins and the minerals that they need, that they're getting enough protein and fat in their diet for whatever life stage that they might be going through? Um, younger animals need more energy to grow. So we have to take that into account when we're looking at feeding animals. But also in terms of energy, uh, we wanna make sure that we're not providing too much or too little, um, right? Animals feed at different rates, they have different metabolisms. We wanna make sure that we're really meeting the nutritional needs of the species that we're talking about. Um, and this certainly plays into not only the animals at the collection, but your pets at home, your cats and dogs, and even humans. Um, so there are nutritionists at all levels of the species that we're talking about. I just happen to specialize in um, aquarium species. Wow, see, that's so interesting because I mean, I guess I'm still young, so I guess I still do need fuel in order to grow. I mean, I guess I have noticed eating this diet has made me grow out instead of up. So can you give me some just tips and tricks? I mean, you're working with baby animals all the way up to giant animals like whale sharks. Oh my gosh. So they have a very special diet. So what does it look like balancing those different nutritional needs? Yeah, well, that, that's a great question as well. And that's, that's the tough part, right? We have so many different species in our collection, all with very specific nutritional needs right? Something that a seal or a sea otter is going to eat and the frequency at which they eat is very different than something like a shark or a ray would eat in our collection, right? They have different feeding needs and they have different metabolisms that really drive these needs. So an average day for me really looks like um, looking at the animals, looking to see whether they are over conditioned, which is a, a polite term for chubby or under conditioned. Maybe they're, they're not eating as much as we'd like them to, to eat. Spend a lot of time um, liaising with our veterinary team and our husbandry teams, and then working on a plan or a specific diet plan to get them to where they need to be. Again, with the goal being a, living a long and very healthy life. Lisa, do you have picky eaters at Georgia Aquarium? And if so, how do you make sure that they're uh, eating a well-balanced diet? Sure. Well, we, we certainly do have picky eaters, and I was probably one of them as a kid myself. Um, but yes, just like humans can be picky eaters and cats and dogs can be picky eaters, we do have individuals at the aquarium that can be picky as well. And how we work around that is probably the same way your parents might have worked around it when you were a kid, is you eat the, the healthy things or maybe the things that you don't want to eat first and then you get the dessert or the good stuff after. So we, we can prioritize what we give animals in order to make sure that they are getting the nutrition that we think they need. And then, you know, they can have the good stuff afterwards. So that's one of our tricks in getting picky eaters to eat all of their diet. And how do you know what an animal needs to eat? Do you have to do uh, research with wild animals to, to know that? Or is, the, is there a book that you can go and reference? <laughs> Well, I wish there was a book to go to, Kristen. Um, that would make my job so much easier, um, but there isn't. So for many of the species that we care for at the aquarium, we don't know a lot of their nutritional needs. How much vitamin A does a manta ray need? Um, there's no book that I can go to to look that up. 
So we do spend a lot of time in the field researching these questions and working with wild animals and studying their diets in the wild and then bringing that information back to the aquarium to better the diets and all the nutritional health um, for our collection animals. So that's the fun part of my job too. So what are some of those metrics that you look at? Like what are vitamins and why do we need them? Yeah, we look at a ton of metrics when we're looking at a whole picture of clinical nutritional health in animals. And vitamins are one piece of that. Um, vitamins are organic compounds that people and animals require in small quantities to stay healthy. Um, there are 13 recognized essential vitamins and, and they're all things that, that you guys have probably heard about, vitamin A and vitamin E and vitamin C and biotin and uh, thiamine, whole bunch of vitamins. Um, they are required um, in small quantities generally and we require them from our food. We can't make them um, internally. So that's why we have to have a very well balanced diet in order to get access to all these different vitamins. And where the really interesting pieces and what makes my job challenging is that whereas humans are one species and we have a pretty good understanding of their vitamin requirements, I'm dealing with a whole host of species at the aquarium that all have very different vitamin requirements. So they are not consistent and they vary across species. So what are some of those factors that you have to take into consideration? Like, does it matter if you have a really, I use, you mentioned earlier age, but does it matter if you have like a really big animal or a really small animal? Does everyone need to eat the same amount or do you have to portion it out? Yeah, we use a lot of tricks to help us and, and scientific data to help us understand how to make diets for animals. Um, and there are a variety of factors that go into that um, with size being one of them. Um, size is largely determines metabolism on animals, but there are a few other um, pieces that go with that. With smaller animals generally having a much higher metal metabolism than larger animals. That also has to do with how animals keep their internal body temperature regulated. Mammals in general, which are warm blooded and can regulate their own body temperature, have much higher metabolisms than things like sharks, which tend not to regulate their internal body temperature and therefore eat less frequently and have a lower metabolism. We also look at things like digestive anatomy. So what does their stomach and their intestinal system look like? Um, so very simple stomachs suggest one way of processing food and very complex stomachs um, like a sea turtle um, can uh, require other ways of processing food and can give us clues about what they may eat in their diet. So we use a lot of science to um, come together and make these decisions about what to feed animals. So I have a question, Lisa. One of these scientific terms I keep hearing are macronutrients like fat and protein and et cetera, et cetera. Are all fats good fats or are all fats bad fats? What can you explain what these macronutrients are a little bit more? Sure. Um, when we talk about macronutrients, we're talking about the big components of food, things like protein, fat, and ash, which is the organic material um, and where all the minerals lie in your food, all those good minerals. And so when we are considering an animal's diet, we need to take into account not only the big things in the diet, like the macro minerals, but also the, the micro minerals, the small nutrients as well. So protein is not protein is not protein. There are different levels of protein and their composition, the amino acids that make up the protein vary. And some animals have very specific amino acid requirements. Um, and so making sure that you get the right type of protein to them is, is key. It's the same way with fats. Fats are comprised of individual components called fatty acids and having the right composition of fatty acids in the diet um, can also be key as well. I think most people have heard of omega-3 fatty acids and that's a healthy thing to include in your diet. Some fishes require omega-3 fatty acids in their diet because they cannot make those omega-3s themselves. And so making sure that you have the right type of diet items helps them get access to these right and correct fats that are in their diet um, to help them live long and healthy lives. Wow, Lisa, you sound like you have a really interesting job and it's always evolving, I'm sure, with new research that's coming out, which you're included, which you're a part of, correct? 
Yeah, that's like I said, that's the fun part of my job is um, when we don't have answers about nutrition for our collection animals, we get to go into the field and find those answers. Um, and so I'm lucky enough to get to work with a lot of shark and ray species in the wild. We've done some sea turtle work. Um, we've done some sea dragon work. So lots, the field is wide open and we have a big need to understand more about nutrition and feeding of wild animals to then help us improve our aquarium diets. So Lisa, if there are viewers out there that don't necessarily want to be a nutritionist, but they're very interested in your job path, is there like a job that's related to yours that people can get involved uh, with your research still, but not necessarily be a nutritionist if that's just not their thing? Sure. I think, you know, at the base of, of what most of us do in this field is um, we're researchers. We, we search through the literature, we solve puzzles, um, we sleuth through the data. And so if nutrition's not your thing, um, maybe there's another question that, um, that grabs your passion in science. And um, at, at the base of that is research or researcher or just a scientist in general, or maybe a marine biologist. I, I, I fall into all of those categories. Um, I just happen to be focused on nutrition. But being a researcher and wanting to solve puzzles, I think is really at the base of what I do and, and anybody can do that. Do you have any inspiring words for the future nutritionists or scientists out there? I think um, my, my inspiring words are to, to stick with your passion. Um, you know, there, there is a very common saying that um, do what you love and you will never have worked a day in your life. And I think that is, that is very true. Um, so I, if, if there's a passion that sparks your interest, stick with it, learn more about it, volunteer in that field, um, and find out if it's, if it's something you want to, to go down the path of. But um, I would, uh, I, I've always wanted to be a marine biologist since I was a kid, and here I am getting to do it at a fabulous facility and with some great colleagues, yourself included. Thank you. <laughs> so Ross, do you have any question? Did this answer all of the reasons why it's important to have a well-balanced diet? Absolutely. Oh my gosh. I have learned so much from Dr. Hoops. I mean, I guess you could say that you've re-stimulated my dietary interests. Now, I've learned a lot, but it also seems like we have so many people in our chat that have also learned so much. So we're actually getting some great questions that are rolling in. So Lisa, one of the questions that came in pretty much right at the beginning of this program is who is the pickiest eater at the Georgia Aquarium? Out of all the animals that you work with, do you have one particular animal that is the most high maintenance, has the most strict or hardest to manage diet? <laughs> Hmm. Well, I would say our Asian small clawed otters are right now one of the, the, the pickiest eaters in the bunch. Um, and they're, they're very intelligent and, and smart. And um, they have a very uh, wide variety of diet items. And there are a couple in the bunch that are very, very picky. And um, we have to get creative on making sure that they get all pieces of their diet. Um, but that being said, any animal can go through phases of pickiness. Um, and so we work really hard to understand why that is and how to get them their complete diet. Oh, that's super good to know. So it's also really fun to hear that not only do certain animals are more picky than others, but certain individuals within that species might be extra picky. Now, another question that rolled in, is there one type of food that occurs or appears in every animal's diet? Is there just like one kind of type of nutrition that need, that every ocean animal needs? I know, for example, here at Moat Marine Lab, a lot of our animals get shrimp and squid in addition to a lot of their dietary supplements. But I mean, what is your recommendation? Is there one thing that a whale shark will eat all the way down to a nudibranch or a snail or a small clawed otter? <laughs> Yeah, that's tough. We do use a lot of seafood in our diets, um, krill and fish and capelin and herring and clams and scallops and things like that. But I would say that there is not necessarily one food item that, that crosses the spectrum of animals. And that really speaks to how varied their nutritional needs are and their dietary needs are. I will say the one thing that we try and get everybody in the aquarium is a multivitamin. And that's because we wanna make sure that we're covering that full spectrum of um, nutrients that they need in their diet, so. 
Oh, that's super good to know. I mean, I'm starting to have to consider a multivitamin, I guess, in order to cancel out my current lunch situation. But thank you be, for be telling me so much about this. I've learned so much. And I do see that we still have a lot of questions rolling into the chat. Unfortunately, I am very aware of the time. So we're almost out of time for today's program. However, if you have any additional questions that we didn't get to today, I would love to have our audience join us on our Flipgrid channel. Now, Flipgrid is an awesome website that we've partnered with where you could leave us a free video question and we'll respond with a personalized video answer. Now, not only will you be able to stay in touch with this video voicemail service with Dr. Hoops, but we also have some really fun downloadable activities that go along with today's episode. So Kristen, how would you describe our Flipgrid page? I would say consider us your STEM pen pals. Oh, fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Hoops. This was so informative. Now, for all of you individuals out there who are tuning in who want to learn about what it's like to be a nutritionist yourself, let's talk a little bit more about our Flipgrid page. Now, I mentioned that we have some amazing activities that are up there for you to download. And one of our worksheets actually has a wonderful little video. Now, we're going to tur turn it over to our Moat Marine Laboratory in intern. Her name is Allie, and she's going to walk us through what our activity is for today. Now, our at-home STEM activity is building your own nutritional diet as if you were Dr. Hoops. Now, what you're going to need is you're going to need four different crunchy snacks, whether it's cereals like the ones we're using or crackers or any other fun snack. Your, jo your goal is to put them into one large bowl, kind of mix them around, and then be able to filter them out and separate them once again. Now, this is showing that some animals only want to eat their favorite foods if they aren't broken down into one kind of meal or mesh. Now, the interesting part is that once you have finished this round, which should be pretty easy, re-separating all the snacks you just had, we want to put them into a plastic bag and then smash them up and then put them back into that bowl. See if you can re filter out the same snacks once they're all broken. Now, this should be a lot harder, but this is exactly what Dr. Hoops was talking about, where she wants to mix all the delicious tasting stuff with all the stuff that's actually good for you into one meal. Now, that way the animals are able to eat it because it tastes wonderful, but it also has a wonderful, well-balanced diet as well. Now, additionally, on our Flipgrid page, we have some wonderful activities provided by the Georgia Aquarium and some amazing videos you can watch on YouTube that focus on Dr. Hoops and what a, her day in the life of an aquarium nutritionist actually looks like. So in addition to leaving some feedback on our Flipgrid, let us know how that experiment went for you. You can follow along Dr. Hoops and see what she does at the Georgia Aquarium with those Flipgrid activities. All right, Kristen, let us know what else do we want to talk about before we have to sign off? Well, I think we need to thank Lisa because she really opened our eyes into the world of not only animal nutrition, but why it's so important to make sure you're getting all of your vitamins and have a well-balanced diet. Would you agree, Ross? Absolutely. So I guess you could say we should let us give her a giant round of applause. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ross. Thanks, Kristen. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Unfortunately, we are starting to run out of time, which is such a bummer. However, we'd love to stay connected with you over Flipgrid. And we also have some really fun episodes coming up. So make sure you tune in. Yes, be sure to check out our next episode where we'll highlight endangered species and their habitats. And to learn more about what Ross and I are up to, check out sarasotadolphin.org and moat.org. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kristen. Thank you so much, Lisa. This was such a fun day. Now, we also would love to hear what you thought of today's program. So as we mentioned in the very beginning of the episode, we have a fun little survey for you. So let us know what virtual learning means to you. What did you think of today's program? What did you learn in today's program? And we'll be providing these little these little surveys at the end of every one of our episodes. Now, after the end of our episode, we are assigning you homework. We want you to go out and share one new awesome fact that you learned with a friend or a family member who wasn't with us today. Because the more you share about these amazing STEM facts, the more we'll care about these amazing STEM facts. So hopefully you are as stimulated as I was. We have learned so much. So now you are on your way to becoming a STEM expert just like Lisa. So tune in for our next episode and we will catch you later. Bye, everyone. Bye. See you next time.